So today's topic, um, I would like to speak about data streams and Elasticsearch. So most of you would have heard about data streams. I bet you would have used a WebSocket space library like socket.io before, or at least heard about it. Um, and in a very different context, you would have heard about Elasticsearch as the search engine that you would use for powering all your full text search needs. Um, so this is a topic I last spoke in May at Glucon at Boulder. Um, the weather at that time was pretty good, and the whole idea of data streams on Elasticsearch was just an ideation. Um, today, when I'm speaking about this, um, we have a working system, and you know, this, at, in this talk, my goal is to convince, um, or at least make a strong point that data streams are going to be important, and they have to be tied with a database. They cannot, I mean, like, you lose a lot of power if you're just using it without a storage layer. Um, so before getting into the details, I would like to tell a little bit about myself. Um, a few years ago, I realized um, I had some very Sith traits, and ever since, I have been a very ardent sci-fi fan. Um, also happened to take a course on sci-fi in school, which was, I think, my um, I think the best course that I recall taking. Um, currently, I'm the co-founder and CEO of AppBase.io. Um, we actually provide data streams and Elasticsearch as a service. So this is a topic that is both um, near and dear to me. Um, a little about how I got into programming. My original motivation six years ago was to um, build video games because I um, grew up, you know, like really playing all um, the good stuff. And from there on, you know, things started getting interesting. I delved a little into um, low-level programming with C, um, built a recommendation engine, got into some high-level stuff, um, decided I really like dynamic languages much more, um, and ex explored a bit on AI, a bit on JavaScript, and over the last couple of years, um, have been exploring a lot on the side of databases and um, real-time processing. So feel free to give me a shout out. My Twitter handle is Siddharth Latest. Um, there's an H in the middle. Um, so guys, we have a problem. Databases have been around for over half a century. In the 1960s, the first database designs were really meant to do CRUD operations. Um, but over time, the needs evolved, you know, um, so databases started adding indexes, then came in secondary indexes. Um, suddenly, distributing data became a huge problem, and we started seeing distributed systems come into place. Um, and along the lines, databases decided that they could try to do everything, and they could be, you know, like everything for everyone. And so they also added these side ideas of materialized views, their stored procedures, so you can like run functions directly in, um, they started expanding into even building aggregations as a part of the database. Um, now, everyone who is around who has, you know, like played with Unix knows that this is totally against the philosophy of, of Unix. Um, what ends up is most of the database softwares out today become very bloated. They are not very useful. They don't do things well. They say something, they do something. Um, and if we at the same time, look at you know like how our data evolution has evolved. Um, it's it's not very good. The picture is not very good. Um, so, the web really came into existence in the 1990s. We had the static web pages. The CRUD operations were pretty good. Um, starting 2000s, the whole social web era came in, and now we had NoSQL databases. The whole web scale movement, um, and all, all the NoSQL, like, no offense, but all the NoSQL stuff hasn't really made anything better. It, it, it introduced a new data model and then came in new SQL, um, but it didn't solve really the fundamental um, data needs as they were evolving. And if you look today, um, the web is nearly real time. And this started like about eight years ago, in 2007, when Twitter launched at South by Southwest. Um, I would say that, that was the very early beginnings of what um, real-time feeds would mean. Today, Twitter has become almost um, the underpinning of the real-time web. I think I'm moving this to be away. 
Okay. So it's not helping. <laughs> um, so the, the whole idea of real-time web today, if we think about it, is not you know, like just this single app called Twitter. It's the whole movement around the Internet of Things, um, the whole recent surge around live video streaming with Meerkat, Periscope coming into the picture. Um, all the apps like mobile data re almost revolutionized how people see and visualize data. And so that changed how web apps were built and designed. So um, I think real-time web is not going away. And the problem with real-time web for databases particularly is um, data is no longer changing. Oops. Data is no longer changing once an hour, once per minute. It is almost changing instantaneously, like every second. How many of you have previously used a WebSockets library? see quite a few hands. And how many of you have used Elasticsearch before? Well, almost half, half the place. So that's pretty good. So, um, the, so most of you know about the ideas here. And um, OK. <laughs> um, so the whole problem with real-time web is um, that data is changing really instantaneously. And the way databases are designed, the way indexing works, the way caching works, the way stored procedures work is not really um, helping to process these things instantaneously. Um, so this is where the whole idea of data streams comes in. And the first time I talk with my you know, like non-geeky friends about a streaming data or a streaming database, um, they start thinking about Netflix, um, streaming videos. Um, which, which is funny, but I think it's, it's not too bad. Um, because if you think about it, um, the whole idea of streaming videos is really to broadcast content um, to a lot of people, which is one of the biggest challenges out there. But databases are more than just streaming binary blobs. Um, you can actually operate on the data if you know the structure. And you can run these queries or run operations on top of it um, in a streaming fashion, just like you'd be watching a video. So with that said, um, really, I would like to say um, the topics um, that we should be covering today um, that I would like to go over are, first is going over what is really the point of data streams? Like, is, is this some sort of a niche? Like, why are we even talking about it? The second part is using Elasticsearch. Why do we decide to use Elasticsearch to power these data streams? And after that, I want to show a live demo that I just made this morning. So I'm really hoping it works out. Um, <laughs> not sure how the demo gods are today for everyone. Um, and then after that, really um, going over the use cases of where we could be seeing data streams um, on the timeline. If you were to build your own system using Elasticsearch, how would you maybe do that? Um, maybe if you wanted to build it with another database, how you would do that? Um, what does the scale look like? What are the problems there? And um, how does the next four or five years look like? So we already use data streams. Um, so if, if you go to Twitter and if you like um, type a keyword, um, and you would see that Twitter shows you like new results um, almost instantaneously. If you wait there, it would like show you that there are 15 new results. Um, and if you look at Google Now, um, the whole idea with Google Now is it can recommend you what is the next blog post you should be reading about, uh, what is the next trip that you have to go for. It pulls in data from all these sources, but the fundamental idea is it predicts what you should be doing. The data sort of comes to you, you are a consumer versus you are an active seeker of the data. Um, so we are already using data stream systems, whether we realize it, whether we call it as data streams or not, um, we already are familiar with it. So I would say this, this is like data streams are pretty important. And you know, like if we are already using it, then how can we build more open source toolings? How can we get the idea more mainstream? And how can we do more things with it? Um, the second point is really interesting, which is Elasticsearch. What's really the connection between data streams and Elasticsearch? Because um, everybody knows Elasticsearch has this awesome distributed full text search engine which is based on Lucene. It can really scale well. 
but it's really geared towards analytics. It's oriented towards documents. Um, it has a good thing it's open source, and it's, I would say, probably going to be one of the most widely distributed systems going down the line, uh, maybe even more than Mongo. Um, so Elasticsearch has this really neat feature called percolation, which has nothing to do with its uh, full-text search capabilities, uh, which if you think of it, it's, it's almost like search in reverse. So the way percolations work are, I mean, visualize this picture. Instead of how a traditional data storage system works, which is it takes data, indexes it into a base, you run queries against this base. There, there are indexes on this data that matches the query. You get the results. Percolation almost works in reverse. It indexes queries. It doesn't index data. Data can be thought of as an incoming stream like JSON as depicted on the top left. Um, and every time a new data comes in, it is matched against the queries. And the results are shown as like, this data matches these many queries. So, if you think of what it takes to build a data stream system, which is the first part is data is coming in real time, whether it is sensors, whether it is a firehose source like Twitter, um, it is almost coming in real time, or whether it is logs, and you have to act on this data and you have to produce results um, that tell you intelligent things about this. Um, so percolation is an ideal fit, and the reason we picked Elasticsearch was you know, for the whole percolation feature. It also helps that percolation is distributed, so it doesn't really have any scaling problems. Um, so without further ado, let's look at how percolation works in practice. So this, this is the Elasticsearch API. What is happening here is you are putting a document in what Elasticsearch calls a type called dot percolator, which is equivalent to a table in SQL. And you're simply registering a query which says that if there is any message called bonsai tree or which contains bonsai tree, then you know, I want to return a match. So once the query is registered, imagine a new document comes into the system. Now, this document contains a message, a new bonsai tree in the office. So it should match. And what you see as you index this document is you get a response telling this particular document matched this particular query. So it's almost happening at index time. As soon as you write the new data, you, Elasticsearch tells you like, okay, this is um, basically the match. So it's pretty useful um, whenever you think of something like a map operation. Or in the Elasticsearch terms, their entire query DSL, which is full text search, fuzzy search, geolocation, um, range queries, everything. There are more than 100 plus queries that can work in this format. So this was a very ideal base to build data streams because at the end of the day, data streams require real-time processing, and Elasticsearch was doing it for us. Um, compared to this, any other database, we would have to put in a lot more work. Now, given that PostgreSQL comes the next closest with its triggers features, um, still, percolation is pretty neat. So after like talking about all these things, let's um, see maybe what a data streams can do in action. So because we build Elasticsearch and data streams as a service, um, the whole idea and the way it works is data streams takes percolation to the next level. While percolation only works at the Elasticsearch system telling you the matches, a data streams API works over HTTP. It can use either HTTP streams or it can use WebSockets. The transport layer doesn't matter. It can even use something like webhooks. Um, the idea is it connects end-to-end -to, -end to the devices, so you are able to see the interfaces updating every time there is a new document coming into the system. So that is uh, the really coolest part. And now, coming to seeing this in action, um, I just had a demo this morning. So I'm not sure if it would work, um, but the idea is what I'm trying to do here is Take the hashtag midwest.io. If anyone tweets using this hashtag, um, I would simply use the Twitter API, and I would um, get the matches and index it into um, app base or index it into a data stream system. And then once I index it into it, 
I should be able to see the results in almost real time. So um, because I'm not a very good GUI person, I decided it was better to just see how the data comes in and um, not think about it. So it almost looks like I cannot show my browser. Um, but if I could have showed it, um, it, it would almost show you the real-time feeds of new data coming in. So if there was a person here in the room who tweeted about Midwest IO, we would see it. And um, almost um, I realized about, um, oh, okay. And almost I realized 30 minutes before the talk that um, it would not be pretty useful if this was not publicly available. So then I decided to hack a very um, small GUI, which looks, you know, it's just text. Um, so if, if you go to midwest.appbase.io, you'd see this list of feeds of everybody tweeting about this conference. So if um, you're tweeting live right now, you would see this update almost instantaneously. Um, and so with that, maybe I'll just put a tweet. Um, and if you go to this URL, midwest.appbase.io, you should see um, the update of this. So let's take a picture of the room. It's awesome. And, or if, even if you tweet anything which has the phrase midwest.io, um, not separated by spaces, you should basically see the update. So at, okay. Um, so it, it, I set it up like an hour ago, so it shows all the tweets from the last hour, and if you keep your tab open, it would keep showing all the tweets of all the events that happened throughout the day. And the way it works is really simple. Um, now that we indexed all the data in the previous um, slide here, um, taking it from Twitter and putting it inside of AppBase, um, all we do now is apply a search query, and this search works on the stream. So just like you would write an Elasticsearch query, you you'd write the same query, and it would open up an interface for you powered by WebSockets. So every time a new match of data comes in, you would see it almost instantly on the interface. So it's, it's pretty neat. Um, another example that I have, um, which I wasn't sure if the first one would work, is um, an app called Meetup Blast. Um, the way this app works is it takes all the data of Meetup RSVPs. So once you have all the RSVPs from Meetup, it shows you them in a live stream. And at the same time, you can find cities. So you can like try to search for Kansas City, and you can try in the topics, new in town, social, nightlife, to want, if you want to check out what are the events other people are attending. And it would keep showing this feed in real time. So what's happening is with data streams and a storage combined, we are able to query not just the new data, but we are almost able to build a news feed-like feature. We are able to query it by heart. If I were to um, even design a query to sh show the meetups by dates, I could do that. Um, so that's all about um, the streams and actions. Um, if we would have time later, I would show it in my browser here on the screen, but I think it's okay. Um, so really the next question you might think is, these were some cool demos, um, but where would I use this? Do I see it using in production? Do I see it using it myself? Um, why would I do that? I think the use cases are plenty. Already today, um, there are tons of places where data streams are the way to go. Um, I would say anything that is to do with streams, fire hoses, um, data coming from IoT sensor devices, is very ideal for real-time processing, and that is where you would use a data stream system. Um, the second example is something similar to Google now. Uh, imagine a monitoring system, or even imagine something like Google News Alerts, where you are typing for certain keywords and you want to be notified every time a keyword matches. Or even imagine your flight buying experience where you are looking for the lowest price and you set an email alert saying if the price changes ever, do send me an email. 
um, or if you're monitoring stocks. So it's, it's useful for all sorts of monitoring systems. I would almost say it's like probably the de facto way to do that. Um, looking at analytics, e-commerce, there are more use cases. Um, even imagining more on the user side, um, the way Uber price surge works is pretty similar to this. There's a real-time data of demand, supply, by locations, and you're deciding the price function based on how this data is changing. Um, so you almost need a streaming system on this, and you also need the historical data, and you also need the data that is changing. Um, Geo-querying systems are also cool because anything that is related to transports has a lot of economic value. Um, so that is where you could use this. Um, so after the use cases, really, um, if you were to build it yourself, like let's say you picked Elasticsearch, you took percolators, you added a WebSockets layer on top of it, how would it work? What would really be the scaling challenges? Um, and could you use it in production? So we did this test um, two months ago. In this test, we used um, Amazon standard compute instances. Um, each instance ran a Docker image of Elasticsearch, and we generated workloads using a framework called Sung um, to the, to the um, frequency of almost varying from zero requests per second to over 100,000 requests per second. Um, and then the way our scaling works, worked was, since it was based on Docker, we could very easily add new Elasticsearch images if we had to. Um, and so the results that we found, um, we only did it till 24 instances because really it was getting crazy, but so far it was scaling really linearly. So um, when we were indexing over 150,000 documents, and of course the document size here matters. Um, each document that we took in was maybe about five, 10 kilobytes of size. Um, we were able to observe that the more instances we added, the more the throughput increased for the system. So that was pretty cool. Um, if you guys have been following Hacker News recently, there was this post of um, Phoenix Framework saying that they were able to do two million WebSocket connections. Um, so contrast that with um, this, which is you're not just having a WebSockets layer, but you're adding a storage layer. And you're still able to do like almost 200,000. And if you added more nodes, you'd be able to do more. Um, so that's pretty cool. And for the WebSockets part, um, we internally use an open source software called Pushpin. Um, it's getting popular recently. Almost imagine it as like, um, Socket.io, but something that really works for your backend systems and something um, that works well. Um, so their benchmarks are pretty well. Um, we are able to observe about 500 milliseconds of average latency if we have over 100,000 clients connecting simultaneously. Um, so that's not too bad. Um, other alternatives for um, the socket part, there are a ton of uh, services. There's Pusher, there's PubNub. Um, on the open source side, I think Pushpin might be the one, I haven't heard of um, more popular ones over there. Um, and the last point is really um, data streams and Elasticsearch, um, that's cool, but what does the idea of a streaming database carry forward if, if we were to call it that? Um, how would the next five years look like? So the first change we are seeing already is the native stream support in major languages. So Node.js had streams supported from the very beginning. Um, stream objects are native to Node.js. Java 8 added a streams um, interface recently. Python added async IO API since 3.5, which are pretty awesome. So the trend is already there that languages are adding stream support. So you can work with streams as a programming construct and operate on streams, even internally or over network. Um, the next part is really, what would the adoption of data streams for a database layer look like? So we did, we, we did this experiment with Elasticsearch, where we are um, doing data streams on Elasticsearch, but why couldn't it be done on any database? Um, I think we would start seeing this trend more and more often there's actually a couple of companies trying to do data streams on uh, Postgres. Um, there's also some moment around the edge-based system. So I would say 
pretty positively that either all databases would adopt data streams as a native interface for not just ingesting data. A lot of um, databases today claim that they can ingest streams. Um, that's cool, but can you also support an interface that other programs relying on you can work with streams? Um, so that's not really happening today, but I think five years down the line it should happen. Um, the really big idea is, um, can we use data streams for everything? So this is really coming from a very um, Lambda architecture fanboy argument that why don't we use data streams everywhere? And I think it does make a lot of sense. There's already a lot of movement. Google built the data flow model, I think, last year. Um, it's getting fairly popular. There's Apache um, Spark, which supports streaming, which is not truly a Lambda architecture because they do micro-batch operations. Um, but there's still Storm. There's a lot of movement going in Samza. If you look on the back-end processing systems, there's a lot of movement going in this um, direction. And there's also Apache Flink, um, which had their, they had their first um, Flink con a few weeks ago. I think they would, they would be doing pretty well as well. Um, so I think down the line, really, can we, um, I, I would say like data streams would become a part. Um, obviously, bash processing wouldn't go away. But data streams are a lot cooler when you think of communication. Because instead of being an active seeker, you are a consumer and you simply act on this. It's um, very decoupled architecture. Um, so that's kind of um, the end of the talk session. All right, so I'll be around um, later on if you guys want to catch up on um, any of these topics. All right, thank you. <laughs>